Father God, we thank you for the reality of your resurrection power. We thank you that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead right now dwells in us. That same power that took him out of the tomb, that brought him into new life, resurrection life that that same power right now is here and available here right now among us father god thank you and father i want to ask that through your holy spirit your power now will be released among us here for each of these people father god you know exactly why they're standing here for some of them it's about their relationship with you for some of them it's about physical healing Father God, I want to ask for you now, through the power of your Holy Spirit, to touch the lives of each of these people. What are your expectations of what God can do? On that first Easter day, three women came to the tomb where they expected to find Jesus' body. They came to anoint a dead Christ. Instead, they found themselves instructed to announce that he is alive. Today, your life can be transformed by an encounter with the living Lord Jesus. Pastor David, in conversation with the members of the congregation, explore how today lives can be changed by meeting Jesus. Father God, thank you for your presence with us this morning. As we've sung together, we've celebrated together, we've seen you touching people's lives, as we've shared communion, you've been built up. Father God, thank you. Thank you that you are here among us this morning thank you for that reality that we see celebrated in the artwork this morning about life jesus is alive so father as we come now to look at your word i ask that you're going to speak to us this morning not that we will gain more information but revelation about you and about your purposes for our lives whether we're someone walking with you or somebody not yet in jesus name amen Unusually this morning, at the end of my teaching, there's going to be an opportunity for prayer ministry. We don't usually do that in the third section of the meeting, but we felt it was appropriate to do that today. So there'll be opportunity for that uh, at the end this morning. Well, as I said earlier on, today is the first time for four years that I have been able to celebrate Easter with other believers. Uh, I've been in uh, uh, other places in the last uh, four years, and it's been absolutely wonderful. What's been really good for me is being able to follow through the events of Easter, if you like, in real time. Being here on Thursday evening with 50 or so other people, with a a table laid out as it would have been in the time of Jesus on the floor, uh, being able to sit with other people and to share communion together and just to relive those events of Maundy Thursday when Jesus was betrayed and uh, it was a very moving and powerful time and then on Good Friday so the following morning continuing with those events as we uh, some of us were at St Hugh's church and able to follow around the different reflective stations there and thinking about how what happened to Jesus then applies in our lives right now, today. And then taking that walk to Northala, following the cross, meeting there with hundreds of other believers on the top of what's known as Mound 3 at Northala, and there being able to celebrate together. Yes, celebrate the death of Jesus. It's rather odd that it's called Good Friday, isn't it, in one sense? But it's good because of its benefit and of the good things for us. So we were there and able to celebrate that. And we were led through that so well by representatives of, of I think it was five different churches that, uh, that led us. And then to be here this morning. I was not at the 545 
celebration communion service this morning. But from those that were there, just hearing, just being there, again, just following the, those events through, if you like, in real time. We as Baptists are often not very good with, uh, we're good with Easter Sunday. But actually we forget there's a backstory that started a couple of days beforehand. <laughs> and you don't appreciate the significance of today if you haven't actually followed the backstory. So being able to walk through those events in the last few days for me has been fantastic. I wonder if for others of you, if there has been a particular thing in the celebration of Easter through Maundy Thursday, Good Friday today that has been particularly significant for you this year. I'm not asking about last year or 10 years ago, but in the last few days, is there something that's been particularly significant for you that's hit you afresh, that God has touched you afresh in this celebration of Easter? Just wonder if one or two, three or four might like to just share quickly with us what that has been. While you're getting your courage together, I'm going to pick on this chap here. Come over here. Thank you, Pastor Warren. For you, this was the first time that you have been at, I think, at an early morning communion service this morning. So I know that there were, you know, we talked about this and you're a bit iffy about whether you were going to go or not when we talked about this on Friday. But what happened for you in terms of God this morning, being there at sunrise, 5.45? I've not asked you this question before. So, um, you know, so this is your warning now. I'm asking the question. So for you, what, and for other people that were there, what's the significance of that in terms of your, your walk with God? With the backstory, um, which I know sort of led, the preparation for the backstory from like Monday, Thursday, etc., really helped sink into me the significance of what Jesus did and what he was able to lay down to do what he did. So then to come to that early morning, Sunday morning, it, and to be at the top and just get this sense of this is a fresh, because the air was fresh, but there was this fresh, Chris, this was a fresh morning when Jesus must have come bursting forth out of that tomb. And however that happened, you know, really sort of saw it happen. For me, there was a, wow, this is real new life. There is a, a freshness in the life for me today. I can go forward knowing that actually there is a hope on a daily, hourly basis. There was that sense, fresh sense of hope. And I felt reinvigorated great thank you anybody else something out of easter this year that you'd like to share okay we'll come back to that later i'd like you to turn to mark chapter 16 we're going to look this morning at the reactions of some of those first witnesses to jesus's resurrection and I want you to try and imagine for them. I'm going to get you to do some exercises in using your imagination this morning. But, but you know, we've been celebrating the fact that Jesus is alive. And so that's very much, your mind is full of that right now. And, and I want you, if you can, to move that to one side and to park it at the side of your brain somewhere. Because we start this story before the resurrection. We start this story early in the morning, but actually in a very depressing and pretty miserable context. Because the disciples had very low expectations of God. Very, very low expectations of the reality of God's activity. You know, and it's my observation, I've been a pastor a long time, it's my observation that not only do non-Christians have a very low expectation of God, but it's my observation that a lot of Christians actually have very low expectations of God and his activity. Particularly when it comes to anything out of the ordinary, anything supernatural. So I want you to come with me this morning. I want you to come and enter into this story, and I want you to, to try and allow your feelings and your emotions to be coloured by the story this morning, parking the end of the story that you know is coming on one side. So let it come as a surprise. 
Can you do that? Try. Just park that to one side and come with me into this story. Remember that Jesus had tried to prepare his disciples for the fact that he was going to die and that he was going to be raised to life again. And uh, when he tried to do that, it didn't go very well. Here's a couple of examples from Mark chapter 8. You don't need to turn to it, but if you want to, you can. Mark 8, 31 and 32. He began, Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Not going terribly well there. A little bit further on, chapter 10 and verse 32. They're on their way to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way and the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the 12 aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We're going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death. They will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. The response? Well, James and John come up to him and said, Teacher, um, we'd like you to do something for us. Uh, we'd actually like, David Wise paraphrase, to have really special places in the kingdom of God, please. Not going terribly well. There was absolutely no expectation among the disciples at all of Jesus' resurrection. And, and it's really striking that all the Gospels say that account. I'll tell you why it's striking. Because you know, if I was writing an account of my experience with Jesus, and, uh, and Jesus said to me, David, this, this, and this is going to happen. And I didn't believe it, but it happened. I think when I was writing about it, I might forget to mention that I didn't believe Jesus when he talked to me. You know, I, I might be just attempted perhaps to play it down a little bit rather than to say that, because it was Simon Peter who was uh, partly responsible for Mark's gospel, um, actually taking Jesus on one side and telling him off for predicting the resurrection. The fact it's there just underlies the reality of this, There was absolutely no expectation. So we begin chapter 16. When the Sabbath was over, the Sabbath was a day when no work was allowed. So you remember Jesus died on Friday. From sunset on Friday to sunrise on Sunday is the Sabbath. And absolutely no work of any sort was allowed to be done. Closed down for the Jews. So when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so they might go to anoint Jesus' body. What are they expecting to see? Not a trick question. What are they expecting to find? A dead body. Very early on the first day of the week, about 5.45 I think it was, Warren. Just after sunrise, they're on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Now these women were three of Jesus' followers and as a mark of respect and devotion, they went to anoint Jesus' dead body. Now Jesus had been dead by this point for one day and two nights. Uh, he wasn't in a fridge. In that context, decomposition would have been very rapid. So going at that point in time to anoint Jesus' dead body was a mark of considerable, strong devotion to Jesus. Now I want you to use your imaginations now. I want you to imagine that you are one of those three women. 
And I know for some of you, imagining that you're a woman might be a challenge, but give it a go, guys. Get in touch with your feminine side. Of course, there were no blokes there. It's the women taking the lead. That's not unusual from what I've observed on various occasions. So, these three women, it's early in the morning. The sun is just coming up. And they're on their way to the tomb. They know about, they were witnesses to the crucifixion, so they've seen that. It's seared in their minds. I want you to imagine what they would have been feeling as they, the three of them, carrying this quantity of spices and oils were on their way towards that tomb. What were they feeling? What were they thinking? What do you think? When I ask questions, by the way, when I'm teaching, some of you are in my teaching for the first time, I, I, I actually, I don't ask rhetorical questions that I'm going to tell you the answer to in a while. These are genuine questions, so I actually want some engagement with you. Is that okay? I saw one person nod then, that's not very encouraging. Is that okay? You're going to help me? You're going to work, work with me here. Okay. So what are, you, what are you thinking and imagining that those women would have been feeling and thinking as they walked towards the tomb. Probably trying to justify why they were doing it um, and probably thinking, well, he was a good man, you know, he deserves, you know, deserves this, at least this, maybe, I don't know. Okay, so maybe feeling a bit guilty perhaps about what they're doing, okay. What else do you think might have been going on for them? I think um, they might have been feel, uh, having some f sense of fear. Um, what condition was he? Is he? You know, was he in since they last saw him when he died on the cross? So, um, what you know, to, sort of preparing themselves mentally for um, um, for the condition that he they were going to find him in. Okay. Yeah. What else? There's some really important things here that we haven't, uh, haven't dug into yet. Deep, deep grief. So they had huge hopes and expectations because Jesus, they were women. And Jesus treated them as equals, unlike the culture of the day. And this person, this rabbi, this teacher, who they had such hopes and expectations about the future, is dead, killed in a gruesome manner. And not just dead, but betrayed. Not just betrayed, but betrayed by one of the inner circle of the 12 disciples who had actually betrayed him, who'd sold him, literally sold him out. So they would have been just inconsolable with grief and heartache and mourning. All of that. Thank you, Steve. What else? I did see a hand over here, so I'm going to be careful by the speaker here. So. Well, I think they were desperate because everything that they'd been believing in the last three years of walking with Jesus, it, it's, just, it's just vanished instantly. Everything. Everything gone. So they were broken, broken people. And, and in that context... All they had left was the dead body. They had nothing else to express their love to. Thank you. I saw. Um, I think I, they were like blaming themselves for what what happened and everything. So they were scared of what the next like thing would happen, if that makes sense. I think the scared's a good thing because they would have known that there were guards possibly at the tomb. So some fear, you know, this is what's happened to Jesus. They probably knew uh, Peter had had to run away. They probably would have known that story. So there's some fear there as well, yeah. I saw a couple of other hands. I'm sure they were thinking, as women would probably think, we are going to give him the best funeral that there can be. 
So they would have taken the body and give the best because that's all they could do anyway. Yeah, they wanted to honor him with what they were, what they were doing. But it was a mournful procession as they went. They probably didn't, I imagine, they didn't talk very much as they trudged along that road. But their minds would have been turning over. They were probably quite tired. I think they probably hadn't slept for a couple of days. With the trauma of all that had happened. They probably hadn't eaten. Because they were in mourning. So that's the context that they were in. And it's important you understand that. To understand as the story unfolds. And just to underline again, we've got the names of people here. We've got dates, places, times. We know that Mark's gospel was written during the lifetime of many of those who witnessed these events. Did you know that there is more historical evidence for Jesus' resurrection, physical bodily resurrection, more historical evidence for that, than there is that Julius Caesar ever existed. Did you know that? And yet in our schools, of course, we talk about Julius Caesar as though he's an absolute dead cert fact. But there is more historical evidence for the physical resurrection of Jesus from the dead than there is that Julius Caesar actually existed. There was a, I've told this story before, um, but I haven't been here for four years, so you know, I don't know if I told it four years ago. There was a guy called Frank Morrison who was a, uh, a lawyer, and he set, to, set out to prove that Jesus hadn't risen from the dead. So he began to investigate the facts, writing an account. Um, there was a problem. He became so convinced as a lawyer the overwhelming amount of evidence that Jesus had raised from the dead, that he became a Christian. Not because he had a faith encounter with God, he did have that, but what turned it for him was the evidence. And the book was eventually published, you can still buy it in the bookshop today, it's called Who Moved the Stone? Frank Morris, brilliant book that just looks at the evidence. So let's go on, verse 4. They were asking each other as they got there, who's going to move the stone away from the entrance? And when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. And as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him, but go. Tell his disciples and Peter. It's interesting the extra reference to Peter there. Wanted to make sure he's still included in the disciples, despite his denial of Jesus. He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered. The women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Now, I need to paint a picture for you. In Jerusalem, there is a place called the Garden Tomb. And I've been there uh, on separate occasions with two different groups of people. It is possible that the Garden Tomb is the actual place where Jesus was buried. It's not proved but it's possible. But what is interesting about it is that it is from exactly the right period in time, it's in the right location, and it's of a similar construction. And let me explain the construction to you of tombs for rich people at that time, because you remember Jesus was put in someone else's tomb. So the it was, it was like this. It would have been cut into a rock face. So there's an entrance cut into the rock face. And behind that entrance, which was a, a low door, behind that entrance, when I say door, I mean doorway. I mean, I don't mean that there was a door hanging there, but, you know, doorway. Behind that, there was usually an antechamber or an entrance room. At the back of that, there was 
another doorway it was always very low not much more than um, about this this sort of height that you had to crouch down to go through beyond that there was another room and in that room was where the body was usually laid that rear room was a couple of meters across in each direction it's where the body was usually laid and outside the entrance there was a large rock, a disc-shaped rock, perhaps a meter um, across, that was rolled down. There, uh, there's a slot cut into the rock, and the, and the rock was rolled down the, uh, the slope to cover the entrance to keep animals out, and it was designed to be very, very difficult to move to stop grave robbers coming along and uh, stealing bodies. So as they arrived, they thought, how are we going to move the stone? Well, in fact, who's going to move the stone for us? Because they felt that three women wouldn't be strong enough. Now imagine you're one of those women. You're coming into, let's imagine it was the garden tomb. It, it's not proved, but they're coming into that garden area it was a garden in the time of Jesus and and they come around the corner and they see at the back of the garden the tomb and as they get closer they see the stone has been rolled away now remember there is absolutely no expectation of resurrection So they're thinking, what's happened? First thought, I think, probably went through their mind. Someone's stolen the body. Can you imagine how devastatingly that thought would have hit them as they're, as they're there? Because they've come early in the morning. They brought oil. They brought spices to anoint the body out of devotion to Jesus. And they've come. But the grave's open. They first thought the body, it's not going to be there. Maybe they thought that the authorities had taken the body away. Maybe it had been grave robbers. But they would have wanted to see inside. Their hearts pounding. Pretty frightened. They would have crept down through that first door. And then they would have crouched down really low and looked through that second door and there was someone in white seated who announced to them he's not here he's risen from the dead The reason we've done all of this work to get you to this point is because their reaction seems a bit strange when you first look at it. But when you understand where they're coming from, what was in their minds, what they were feeling, I think you would have done the same thing if you were them. They ran terrified away from the tomb. They're not going to tell anybody. That's their thought as they run away. Who's going to believe three women? Women, women couldn't give evidence because they weren't considered to be um, worthy or, and accurate to give an account of anything. Who's going to believe three hysterical women that some bloke in white has turned up and announced that Jesus has risen from the dead? People don't rise from the dead. It doesn't happen. There was virtually... For most Jews, no belief in an afterlife even. It's one of the big debates among the Jews. Okay, my next question for you. It's a difficult question. When you look at the story so far, we're going to look a bit more of the story in a moment, but when you look at the story so far, and you think about your life, our lives, 
people's lives today, what lessons are there that we can learn from this that can help us today, from this so far? We haven't met Jesus yet. That's going to happen in a minute. What do you think? Hmm, some head scratching going on. What we see around us isn't necessarily what's going on. Yeah. We can expect the expectant. Uh, you can, we can expect things to be things which happen, which are out of our remit of, of thinking. Okay, so we should be open to the unexpected. Yeah, yeah. Just thought I'd help you along there. I thought that's where you were going. Hi. Um, if you believe um, in something, don't give up on your belief. Meaning that Jesus' words gave them His words, and um, if they had believe him until that time, they wouldn't be surprised of the tomb being empty. Yeah. It's a lesson about holding on. Did I see your hand waving as I walked past? It's okay to be alarmed um, when things happen the way we don't expect it to. And also, even though when the ladies went, they were not expecting Christ to arise, but they were still devoted, and there was still a bit of hope. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Turn back to me, back with me, to Matthew's Gospel. I just want to read a couple of verses from there, from Matthew 28. If you want to turn to it, uh, it's page 1000. If you've got one of our mauve-coloured church Bibles, soon to be replaced. Verse 8, the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Then suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him. They clasped his feet because at this point they're laying on the ground, fallen in front of him. They worshipped him. And Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. The day had begun with women going to anoint a dead body. The day continued with meeting Jesus, who wanted them to proclaim a living Christ. It seems that they fled from the tomb intending to keep what they'd seen to themselves but then something unthinkable totally unexpected incredible took place they met Jesus personally and it transformed their lives and situation I want to read to you from one of my favorite writers on Mark's Gospel it's a uh, a guy called William Lane. And uh, it's quite a long reading. So I want to, I want to read this to you. He's writing on um, that last verse of Mark's Gospel. Mark 16 and verse 8. The account of the empty tomb is soul-shaking. With his closing comment, Mark wanted to say, that the gospel of Jesus the Messiah is an event beyond human comprehension. And therefore it's awesome, 
It's frightening. The ending leaves the reader confronted by the witness of the empty tomb with the focus upon human, inadequate, lack of understanding and weakness. And that throws into bold relief the action of God and its meaning. God acts. Humans are bewildered. So today as we celebrate Easter, it's not simply about remembering the past. We do need to remember the past, to understand the past. But actually it also is about the present. Because Jesus was not just alive, Jesus is alive. Amen? Amen? Amen. Now here's a question for you. You say that very boldly. I heard some very bold amens. So here's the question. I'd like you to briefly answer some of you. How do you know that Jesus is alive today? You've said amen to that very loudly, very boldly, didn't you? Yeah? I wasn't imagining it, was I? So how do you know if someone came up who didn't know anything about Jesus and yet they just heard you say that? Well, it's an extraordinary statement. How do you know that he's alive today? So a few answers. Because he lives in me. What does that mean? He communicates with me. I feel his presence. I, I receive from his word wisdom and guidance. He's alive. Okay, active communication. Mm -hmm. What else? Um, I write a journal of how God has been speaking to me in, in the situations that I go through and how he's answered prayer or is telling me to hold on. And I write that down and I go back over it to see how God has been speaking to me in situations. So you're, you're generating an evidence record of God's activity in your life. Yeah, by keeping a journal, writing down what God is up to, keeping a record of that. Very good. Yep, I will come back, sorry. Faith, the faith you have in God will uh, overpower anything and if, like, if you truly believe in him, you will know that he has a plan behind everything he does. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, I'm all the way at the back. Um, I'd like to tell a story about something that happened. Um, a while back, my dad was diagnosed with cancer. And I had a phone call from my mum, and she really upset me about it. And I was quietly in my bedroom. I live on my own, so there's no one else who would have known what I'd said to God in this room other than him. And the following morning, one of my friends sent the actual answer in a text. So I have a text or message on my phone that basically answers the question that I posed to God, and no one else could have ever known the answer. So God doesn't just work, doesn't just talk to me, he talks to my friends. Okay, good evidence. Take one or two. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and I was going to say, because some of the stuff that I've gone through in my life so far, I know I couldn't have done without God. So the evidence of Jesus being alive for you is that he has given you strength to cope with situations that otherwise you would not have coped with. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Praise God. Um... God has healed me. I, I went in a coma um, for 16 days and um, I couldn't walk, couldn't talk and all those things. And I believe God because he said he would never leave me nor forsake me. And he has healed my body. It has been um, actually uh, 11 years, is it? Yeah, 11 years now. And I know him. I know his, the, the power of God. I know that he has raised me from that 
coma situation and I'm here so I can tell somebody the power and the healing of God's hands and the love of God. Mm -hmm. Very good. I have experienced his presence and um, his peace and his comfort at the most difficult times in my life. And I have also I have seen his healing, physical healing in my body in his name. Okay. Take just a couple more. Seen his power, seen demons being cast out of people, and uh, just seen the authority and power which we see in the Bible today. So, you, sorry, you, so you, you've, because we read about demons in the Bible, and a lot of people think that's just, you know, that was then and people are a bit ignorant. But you're saying that today, I just want to make sure I've understood this correctly, you're saying that today you have seen that same power of God in people's lives turfing out demonic spirits from people? Yes, yeah, in Cyprus last year we had a mission trip. And uh, Amy, just 16, was that 16 or 17 at the time, was casting out demons out of uh, uh, people who were oppressed. Through God's power. I don't think it was, yeah. <laughs> just just might have made that absolutely clear. Right, two more. Um, I was just going to say that what's so magnificent about God's power is that he said that the same power that he had in his he had in terms of when he died and he rose again that that same power that we have that power as children of God and that if we just call on his name that we're able to overcome in certain difficult situations so through faith fantastic last one um, before I became a Christian I used to just go to church Catholic church and I felt absolutely nothing in my heart it was just nothing at all and since I became a Christian whenever I'm singing or praying, or even talking about God, I feel something inside, like inside I'm excited, like something is alive in there. Whereas before I was a Christian, there was absolutely nothing. So I know for sure that Jesus Christ is alive now that I found him. Yeah. Fantastic. And that's a very interesting thing, because you know, um, a lot of you will have had the experience of being in love with somebody. Anybody had that experience? Feel you've been in love with somebody? So another human being, yeah? Now, if, if I asked you, I'm not going to. You can put your hand down, Steve. It's all right. I know you're very enthusiastic. <laughs> if I asked you, I'm not going to ask any of you, but if I, if I asked you to prove to me, actually, that you have got love for that person, you're going to be a bit pushed to do that. You would be able to talk about the way that your life has been changed by your relationship to that person, things that you might do, you might talk about some of your feelings, but none of us would, would look at you, whoever we pick. I'll pick Timmy because he's my friend. None would look at Timmy and say, well, no, Timmy, you're, you're wrong. You can't prove that to me. We'd accept the fact that because you're talking about what you're feeling and the way it's changed your behavior, the reality of your love for Ola. 25th wedding anniversary just this week we celebrated earlier on. And it's that same thing when we, we talk about Jesus. People talk about the fact, the reality of Jesus in their lives, bringing change and transformation, knowing his presence, hearing his voice. He is alive today, bringing change and transformation in people's lives today. Not in some theoretical sense, but in real, actual terms. I could probably go around this congregation this morning. I'm not going to do this. But nearly all of you who have a relationship with Jesus... If I pushed you, you would be able to talk about an event or more than one event or one piece of evidence that you have in your life for the reality of Jesus alive in you. So today, for all of us here and others watching this subsequently on the internet, today Jesus is alive. And today you, wherever you are, here, wherever else in the world you might be, you can experience the reality of Jesus in your life. For some of you here this morning, some of you here watching this, you've never yet come to that place of commitment to Jesus. You don't have a relationship with him. You know about him. It's a bit like you and the Queen. You know, you know about the Queen, you know lots of facts about the Queen. You know where she lives. You know what she does. You may know the names of her dogs. But you don't have a relationship with the Queen. 
You met her once. Yeah. Do you have a relationship with her? <laughs> but it's like a lot of people are like that with, with God and Jesus. They, they know where the house is. They know a number of facts. But they don't have an ongoing relationship with him. But God sent Jesus into our world because he wants that relationship. And there is that invitation for you right now at this moment in time to find that relationship with Jesus. It's about coming and, and recognizing that he is alive. It's about coming and saying sorry for things that you've done wrong. Inviting Jesus into your life to bring change and transformation in the way that these women, when they met Jesus unexpectedly, their lives were changed and transformed forever. For some of you here this morning, you have walked with God closely in the past. You've walked with Jesus, had a good relationship. But right now, that's not the case for you. And there could be all sorts of reasons for different people this morning. It, it may be that you, you've done things that, that you knew weren't right things to do and your relationship with God has, has gone off. It may be because of other situations and circumstances that have crept into your life, that have pushed God to the margins. But God's feelings for you has not changed. He still wants to bring that change and transformation in your life. He wants the very, very best for you. The reason he brought you into being is still the same. He has plans and purposes for you. Things he wants to do. He wants you to become all that he created you to be. So there's an invitation for you right now, this afternoon, to come and renew your relationship with God. And also we've talked about healing this morning. I believe in a God who brings physical healing into people's lives. We've heard some testimonies about that this morning. I could go around and we could get more, but it's a reality that's there. And I believe that here this morning, God wants to heal people. So in a moment, we're not going to sing any songs, we're not going to have any nice spooky music in the background, but in a moment I'm going to ask you to stand, and I simply want to ask you that if you want to make a response to God this morning, and you'd like some people to pray with you, maybe coming to God for the first time, maybe returning to God, maybe it's about physical healing, I'd like you simply to come and walk out the front here, and I and others from the leadership and others here will pray with you and for you. So I'd like to invite you, if you're able to, to stand. And I'd like you to just turn over what's been said this morning. And I'd like you to give an opportunity for God to speak to you this morning. Father God, we thank you for the reality of your resurrection power. We thank you that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead right now dwells in us. That same power that took him out of the tomb, that brought him into new life, resurrection life, that that same power right now is here and available here right now among us. Father God, thank you. And Father, I want to ask that through your Holy Spirit, your power now will be released among us here. For each of these people, Father God, you know exactly why they're standing here. For some of them, it's about their relationship with you. For some of them, it's about physical healing. Father God, I want to ask for you now, through the power of your Holy Spirit, to touch the lives of each of these people. Right where they are, right now. If you're in the congregation, and you can't see what's going on here. I'd like you just to be praying with us, be praying for these people. If there's someone you know that's come to the front, just from where you're sitting, just pray for them. 
Uh, if not, just pick someone else or pray for everybody. But prayer is not a spectator sport. It's something we all participate in. Father God, so I ask you now to pour out your Holy Spirit upon these people. Come with your power, Father God, into the lives of each of these individuals. Come by your power into the lives of each of these individuals. Bring transformation. And the way we saw that transformation in the scripture this morning, as those women's lives were turned upside down by an encounter with the risen Jesus. I want to ask right now for an encounter with the risen Jesus for each of the people here this morning. By your power, Father God. Bring change and transformation. Father, set people free. Where people are in emotional bondage this morning. Mental bondage this morning. I want to ask that you will set them free in the name of Jesus. In the power of your spirit, set them free. Bring healing and wholeness. Father God, where there are people here with physical needs this morning. I believe that your Holy Spirit brings healing and wholeness to people. And I want to ask for each of these people here now who are standing in front of us here and in front of you, Father God, that your spirit will touch their lives, whatever part of their body it is that needs healing, that, Father God, your spirit will be there right now working in them, bringing healing and wholeness, change and transformation, renewal into their lives. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Okay, people who are standing with people, I'd like you just to come the other side of them and uh, for just you to talk to them or pray with them, whatever's in your heart, because it may well be as you've stood there, God's spoken to you. So I'd like you just to to do that, to continue to pray. Um, uh, Congregation, we have finished this part of the meeting this morning. Um, you can sit if you'd like to. You can go on praying for these people if you'd like to. You can go and fetch your children from Kresh or Sunday Club if you'd like to. You can leave if you'd like to and tell people outside the amazing news that Jesus is alive. Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.